We're back, ladies and gentlemen, with episode two of the Supremely Mind-Bending Maniac. So take your pills and settle in, because it's gonna get weird. While episode one focused on Owen, episode two focuses on Annie. Here in her apartment, we're struck with a vast contrast from the structured, business-like world of Owen Milgram. Clutter adorns the room, and highlighted is a book of modern art. Not surprising, considering a 2013 study from the University of Minnesota concluded that those that keep cluttered houses are often more creative. Annie pulls out a pill bottle and has a few harsh words with the last remaining tablet, shaped like an A before crushing it and snorting the residue like cocaine. What follows is a seemingly euphoric experience seen in fast motion as her roommates blur about their day around her. You'll notice here more rainbow imagery hearkening back to Neberdeen. Annie awakens from her high with a tear rolling down her face as Flash Gordon plays on the TV. She pulls out a cigar box where we see her copy of Don Quixote that she pulled from the trash in episode 1, inferring the events here take place after the opening of that episode. We get a view of scars on Annie's back, a reference to the events at the end of this episode as she pulls out a picture who will later learn is her sister Ellie before getting to work on a lost dog poster. She glares once more at the pill bottle and we get a few more clues as to where it came from. More Japanese lettering and the words saying, Trial ULP Fake. 3, confirming its connection to NBP and Owen's ULP screening. There's also the letter A, like the pill, and this is a test. Outside, Annie puts up the lost dog posters and we get a look at her creation. Might be a little too late looking for a dog lost seven years ago, but take note of the woman in the picture. It's her sister, not her. At a noodle shop, Annie takes in a few ads from Ad Buddy. I'm guessing this is how Annie paid for her meal, as we'll later learn she's having trouble paying the rent. When Buddy here mentions the limitless options they can offer, Annie expresses a desire to reach Salt Lake City to see her sister, and wonders if Ad Buddy could pay the way. Buddy says it should only take a few thousand ads. Yikes. Back home, Annie packs a bag and picks up Don Quixote, claiming she's healthy Annie now, no more pills. It's no coincidence that Don Quixote is referenced so much. The story is of a noble who loses his sanity reading too many chivalrous romances and takes on a quest to revive chivalry. Don Quixote does not see the world as it really is and prefers to imagine he is living out a nightly story. Sound like anyone we know? However, Annie's quest to reach Salt Lake City is thwarted due to lack of funds and she pays a visit to her dad Hank, a cross between Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey and a vampire coffin. Hank is hidden away Away from the world in an avoid, seemingly as a way of avoiding his problems, mainly the sorrow he feels from Annie's mother's passing. I'm also getting big Back to the Future vibes from these numbers, yet another homage to the 80s. Annie hits up Dad's safe for some bus money and we see a gun. Could this be the same gun she makes reference to in episode 1? She becomes visibly upset, which is no surprise considering her dad has locked himself away. But this doesn't seem to stop her from taking a lot more than a few bucks for the bus. With cash in hand, she grabs her bag and heads out. Notice the same style painting here in her apartment as in her dad's place. Before entering the terminal, we get a glimpse at the Soldiers and Sailors Arch at Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn that has been covered in neon lights. Inside the bus terminal, Annie purchases a ticket to Salt Lake City but hallucinates while looking at the rolling bus numbers. The entire board forms the letter A. While Owen's issues stem from his schizophrenia, Annie seems to be an addiction to this mysterious A drug. The drug has won this day, and she needs more. At Washington Square Park, Annie meets up with her supplier, Calvin. He's playing a classic game of New York chess with a purple robotic gambling koala. Turns out, pill A isn't something you can just order whenever you want. Calvin snatched it from his dad, who works for NBP and can't get her anymore. Annie pleads for a lead, but he tells her NBP has gotten way more secretive since the suicides. But after Annie drops some bus money, he gives the name of Neberdeen's intake director, Patricia Lugo. Annie visits Doc Shop, an establishment which helps find dirt on others by gaining access to people's personal information. It's essentially the opposite of the Identity Stolen ad from Episode 1, and wouldn't you love the irony of the same ad off to the side here. Inside, Annie drops more of her dad's cash to blackmail Patricia Lugo. Looks like they don't take ad buddy in exchange for doxing. Apparently Patricia has a disorderly arrest on her record, was a gambler and lost custody of her daughter, then had it all scrubbed so she could get her job at Neberdeen. For a fee, Mr. Doc says he'll even threaten to kidnap her kid. That shit always works. Instead, he finds she's a user of something called Friend Proxy for Pretend Friends, a service not unlike Daddy's Home where someone fills in as your friend. 
It's clear this world is really painted as one of loneliness, people lacking connection. Annie intercepts Patricia at a botanical garden. Notice all the bonsai trees which make a number of appearances at the NBP labs. She pretends to be her proxy friend Juanita, and notice the friend proxy pin she wears just like the man from episode 1. But after a slip up in her story and a glance over at two young girls in the garden, perhaps reminding Annie of herself and her sister, she gives up the goat and retreats. If you recall, this young girl here is Owen's niece that we saw in episode one. How did you know? But rather than counting herself lucky and leaving, Patricia follows Annie. Maybe that's how desperate for human connection she is. Annie explains the reason she blackmailed Patricia is to get into the Neberdeen trials because she needs more of those pills. The only thing that makes her feel better about her relationship with her sister. She describes a cold rock that has been left in her stomach by an argument they had five years ago. Patricia tells her she could reach out to her sister, but Annie says, I can't. The story works and Annie gets to take the defense mechanism test that Owen did in episode one. Here she gives answers she thinks the screener wants to hear, such as super happy and togetherness. Perhaps the only response close to a real one is her reaction of sisters making faces at each other. The screener then does the final stare down, but Annie just holds, her vitals rising before getting the red light. Guess her defense mechanisms weren't fungible. A pissed off Annie decides to take Mr. Dox's original advice and blackmail Patricia, saying if she doesn't get into her study, she'll never see her daughter again. Guess he was right, that shit always works. Now the story starts to connect from episode one, as we cut to Owen staring Annie down. He heads in for his ULP test, while Patricia upgrades another tester to a much, much safer trial, and hands Annie her golden ticket. We arrive back in the pod room and are treated to an introduction video and our first look at Dr. Mantle Ray, played here by Justin Thoreau, who does a fantastic job of bad acting. His last name you might remember from the ad Annie passes in episode 1. Could Greta Mantle Ray be his mother? I gotta say, this was one of my favorite parts of the whole episode. The 80s VHS style effects, the specific cuts made in the video, no one sees inside your head, says Dr. Muramoto assuredly, then six seconds later, but us. The video's purpose is to explain how the test works, and it's simple. Three pills taken in three steps, analyzed by the most sophisticated mega computer ever developed, the GRTA, eerily similar to Greta. After ingesting the pills, the machine's cutting-edge artificial intelligence will identify, map, and confront the learned programming of your brain. Simple, right? Pill A, Annie's pill, is called agonia, which in Greek translates to of severe mental struggles and emotions, agony, anguish. This pill pulls out your core traumas and worst memories of your life and maps them for pill B and C. But don't worry, it's safe. Pill B, behavioral, identifies your mind's defense mechanisms and blind spots. Your blind spots. Pill C, Confrexia, Confrontation, the end of the rainbow, likely why we've seen so many rainbows referenced throughout the show. Once Pill A and B have worked, Greta will remap your brain and voila, you're cured. Simple, right? Dr. Muramoto asks if anyone has questions and then ignores the ones who do and lets the evens know they're going to get a delicious pre-weighed meal while the odds hit the microwave chairs. As Annie lines up for the test, we get a look into Dr. Fujita's control room. Notice some of the shoulders of the workers who have yellow stripes and the one man on the right who has blue or indigo, suggesting the rainbow colors of MBP separate into different departments of the company. In the lineup, Owen tells Annie everyone thought he was crazy, but they were wrong. Annie replies they'll talk about this later. She's going along with him as to not attract attention. In the supercomputer room, we find Dr. Muramoto reading a poem to Greta. It's William Blake's The Angel Poem, suggesting that she is seen as a guardian angel. It seems like Greta is more complex than a regular computer and enjoys this poetry, almost as if she has emotions. Later, Dr. Fujita implies Greta's safety net is connected to how much she liked the poem. The odds get placed in their chairs and are donned with x-ray vests straight out of your dentist's office. Dr. Fujita addresses her crew and explains the test subject data over the next three days is vital to their success and that the subject's lives are in their hands. No more mistakes. Don't worry, it's safe. Finally, Annie gets her pill and the machine fires up. Electrical wires get sent from the chairs to the computer. Wires depicting the connection from each participant can be seen with one being Owen and nine being Annie. 
Dr. Fujita instructs the crew to be gentle and that hard entry is their enemy. In Annie's mind we see a Dutch windmill, windmill being the title of this episode, and a sign saying, Leave to the Nightingale her shady woods. This is a reference to William Wordsworth's poem called To a Skylark, the poem itself about a skylark's connection to its roots while also flying high. But of interest is the line, Leave to the nightingale her shady wood. The nightingale is a songbird that, unlike the skylark, keeps to the woods. Is Annie our nightingale and her sister the skylark? In this memory, Annie pumps some gas and sports a new short hairdo as her sister Ellie comes from inside. We can assume this memory is at least five years or older, as we know from the earlier conversation with Patricia that this is how long it's been since the two last spoke. And considering this is a pill A memory, aka agonia, it's also likely the origin of Annie and her sisters falling out. Cute sister hijinks ensue. That night, in a motel room, the two gloss over their tumultuous relationship with their mother and escape into fantasy. Ellie explains her move to Salt Lake City is because of her fiancé and opens up about her fears of stability. She's afraid she'll screw it up and thus screw up her future kids, just like what happened to the sisters. But in this fantasy, Ellie explains she doesn't screw up, she has her happy ending. Rather than act supportive, Annie pushes back and they argue. Ellie brings up the fact that Annie can't take care of anything, which Annie assumes is a reference to Ellie's dog, inferring that she lost him. They sling more insults, calling each other mom, and Annie gets mean, stating how happy she is that Ellie is moving far away. The next morning, Annie begins a careful attempt to reconcile and decides to take a serious picture with her sister. Ellie holds the wheel as Annie goes to take a selfie, but eventually, Annie makes another joke of it. As the two grapple over the camera, a truck comes barreling down the wrong side of the road and plows into them, sending Annie and Ellie over the side of the road. Annie is flung from her car and lives while her sister is left to die in the wreckage below. Thus why Annie explains she can't reconcile to Lugo. Here amongst the blood, you can also see the fresh scar wounds on Annie's back, the same place her scars were seen at the beginning of the episode. Back in the test room, we see a crying Annie similar to what happened on her couch the last time she took Took the pill. Pill A has located her trauma, but what kind of effect has the pill had on Owen's brain? And what will pills B and C have for them down the line? Thanks again for watching. If you like this series, please make sure to like and share it. There's a whole lot more to unpack in the upcoming episodes, so I hope you'll join me. Until next time.